Good evening, everyone. I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? All right. We're going to let the intro happen uh, in the background, <clears throat> and then I'm going to start talking. Uh, Ronnie asked a question right off the bat, uh, if I could help uh, show how to save files after uh, finishing uh, your drawing and doing your tool pass, so we'll definitely do that. Not a problem, Ronnie. Not a problem. Let me get into the uh, Vetrix software here. <clears throat> get this frog out of my throat. Alrighty. So how's everybody doing tonight? Now I haven't switched over to my new platform yet. Uh, I, I gotta uh, work on that. But we should be running smoothly tonight. I did everything uh, as I'm supposed to. So I shouldn't have any delays or hiccups or anything like that. Let's hope. Fingers crossed. I don't want to speak too soon. Um, but uh, yeah, Ronnie, we can surely go over that uh, creating a project and um, uh, saving a file and everything for sure. Let's get, uh, let me get to my files here. Bear with me a second. All right, so we're gonna give it a few minutes. Uh, we're li still a little early, it's 7.13. We're gonna give it a few minutes uh, to let everybody get in and um, then we'll get started. Hello, Debbie. Script, a while back you did a show how to modify a cut to cross a vector. All right, Skip, be a little, if you could, a little bit more descriptive in that, and um, I'd be happy to show you. That one's not reaching off the top of my head just yet. Let me see here. All right, let's see here. Skip, how to modify a cut to cross a vector. Uh, Let me think about that one, Skip. If you could be a little bit more descriptive. Uh, do you mean like, <clears throat> like if I have a vector uh, and another vector that intersects with it, how to... Uh, Cut across a vector? Oh gosh, man, I'm a little lost on that one. Help me out with that, Skip. Be a little bit more descriptive and let me see if I can answer that one. Um, let's see here. Don't remember a lot. You were using positive and negative numbers to move the toolpath. If you only need to move the toolpath a couple of thousands or two. All right. So right out the bat, we're getting stumped here. I'm getting stumped. Let's see here. You were using positive and negative numbers to move a toolpath 
if you only need to move the toolpath a couple thousandths or two. The only thing that that, that reminds me of, Skip, is if, um, if we have intersecting vectors, doing an offset a few thousandths of an inch so those lines don't intersect one another. But I don't think that's what you're asking. Uh, Kevin Wilkerson, no, I've never cut vinyl records on my CNC machine. Would love to one time because uh, it's uh, it looks pretty fun to do. Uh, you can create some really cool designs on those vinyl records and everything. But no, personally, I have never cut vinyl records on my machine. Oh, Skip's got me stumped. Let me see here. You were using positive and negative numbers to move the toolpath. If you only need to move the toolpath a couple thousands or two. It's all right, Skip. That's not a problem if you're mistaken. Um, I'm thinking that... I'm thinking, are you calling a tool a vector a toolpath or is it actual a uh, toolpath? Because, you know, we create the toolpaths on the vectors in our design. And if, if I had intersections or overlaps or something and I needed to move them off, I would do an offset. But that's the only thing that's coming to mind uh, for me, Buddy Row. That's the only thing that's coming to mind. And um, let me think on that one a minute, Skip, and I will get back to it for sure. Maybe uh, in the meantime, uh, we can kind of... Uh, figure that one out together. Let's switch over to the Vetric software real quick. And let me show uh, Ronnie how to save uh, his files and everything, how you all would save your files. Let's get over to our uh, full screen capture. And what you'll see here is I've got a design up and uh, within that design, I've got the tool pass uh, for the um, panel cuts and, and everything. And let's actually um, turn off that vector and turn on panel one. There we go. Um, for creating these tool paths and stuff, our profile cut and our pocket cut. Now, once my tool paths are created, Ronnie, once the tool paths are created, the first thing is, is I absolutely want to make sure I come up to the file menu here and click on save to save my design, save all my work so I don't lose it or anything. And if up here, if you look at the top, it says library chair. And so that means that uh, the project itself has already been saved initially, but I need to save my changes. So I'm only going to go to the save option. If this said new up here, that would mean that I need to save my work as well. And I could use the save as option in that case and I could give the file a name and save it but in my case it's already saved so all I need to do is click save here or in the drawing tab I can use the save option here save the current file and that will save all of our design work now saving your tool pass is completely different to save your tool pass on the tool pass side of the software we want to use the save toolpath icon. It's generally the last icon on the last row of your toolpath operations. And when you're in here, there are uh, your post processors. And so Ronnie, uh, I believe you are a digital woodcarver customer. So you would either be using the digital woodcarver inch tap post processor, or if you have the latest post processors, uh, post processors uh, in your software, you would most likely be uh, using the new Digital Woodcarver Helical Arcs Inch Tap, uh, which is the latest one, but either one of the two, Digital Woodcarver Inch Tap or Helical Arcs Inch Tap. And so with the correct post processor chosen, we're gonna, uh, there's a couple of ways that we can save a toolpath. So one, if I do not have the box up here checked that says output all visible toolpaths to one file, if I do not have it checked off, then that means I need to select the toolpath. I need to highlight and select the toolpath. Notice right here, toolpath to be saved. Notice here, um, whatever toolpath is selected is the one that it's going to um, save for us. 
if I have this object checked up here, then I'm not going to select because that doesn't do anything. I'm going to use my check boxes. I'm going to check off the toolpath that I want to save. And if the two toolpaths use the same bit, in the case of the digital woodcarver, uh, that doesn't have a tool changer at all, if they use the same bit, then we could save both of those toolpaths as one file to run. If they use different bits, then we would need to save one file at a time. So we would check off the toolpath that we want to save if we have this checked up here, or we would select the toolpath we want to save if we don't have this checked. Either one, we need to make sure that it says toolpath to be saved and it's the correct toolpath that we're trying to save. That's important. We click on the save toolpath option and it's gonna open up our files. And <clears throat> notice here, I have in my documents, I have a folder called chair ladder. And that's the job folder. Uh, and so in that job folder is where I wanna save my toolpaths. Now your toolpaths, you can name them anything you want. Now I've got them named panel one, side one, pocket one, 0.25 end mill, right? Gives me a little bit of information. Uh, but a nice way to uh, save your work and everything is to give yourself some information that will help you when you're out at the machine. And so if I were to um, look at this job and save it, uh, this would be the first file that I'm going to run on my machine. So I'm going to give it a number, 01. Then I'm gonna take and use an underscore because I don't like any spaces in a file name. In a folder name, spaces are fine. In a file name, uh, use an underscore or something. Uh, no spaces, um, it doesn't really matter, but it, it's important, it's, it's proper. And so I'm also gonna put in the size of my material, 37 by 12.5 by 0.75. So now I've got, this is the first file that I'm gonna run, then I've got my job size. And then I'm gonna put the name of the, the job, chair ladder. And after this point, if there's any information that I want in here, like for instance, this is side one, pocket one, I'm gonna put that in there so I know what it is, okay? Side one, because this is a two-sided job, so I need side one and side two. And then I'm gonna put in the router bit information, 0.25 in mil. Now you can get that router bit information up here in the corner. And so now I've got a file name that when I open this up in my software to my controller software, I know for this job that this is the first file that I'm gonna run for side one. I need a quarter inch end mill in my router bit and my job piece, uh, my board, my material needs to be 37 by 12 and a half by three quarters. So that way if I wanna run this job tomorrow, a week from now, a year from now, whatever, when I'm at the table, I don't have to go back into my Vetric and figure out what in the world I did. Now, when I save this toolpath and everything, if I were to go back and look at that toolpath, the newest post processors in the uh, Vetric software uh, for Digital Woodcarver, uh, there's some file information uh, that actually gets put into the the g-code and this file information gives me details about my job and so I've got you know my file details the file name is in there uh, the date it was created my material size is laid out for me in here my z0 position I'm touching off on my waste board the table surface I'm starting in the bottom left corner and I'm gonna be using a quarter inch end mill and things and if there were any notes that I wanted to leave myself, those notes would show up in this blank spot right here. And so when it comes to saving your toolpath, you can use the generic names that, that the software creates. When you're calculating your toolpath, you can actually create a name for that toolpath when you calculate it. Or when you're actually saving the file, you can go in and you can give it a name when you save it. But my thing is, is, is making sure you have a job file, a job folder, should I say, for all your files. For every sign that you do, every job you do, you should have a folder for it. 
And inside that folder should be the Vetric CRV file. There should be your toolpath files, any graphic files that you used in that project uh, and, and things like that. And everything is nice and organized on your computer. Uh, so that way you're not hunting around and searching around for things. Um, I used to have a bad habit of just saving my toolpaths. They would just fall wherever they may in my documents folder. And I would have hundreds and hundreds of different toolpaths. All just every time you opened it, there was just nothing but toolpaths. And I couldn't, you know, if I had five or six toolpaths for one job, there could be a chance where I actually miss a toolpath when I'm running that job because they're all willy nilly all over the place. And so I'm a big advocate of creating a job folder. And inside that job folder, all your files for that job folder and everything. And, um, you know, I save my file in the job folder, my actual project file. I save my toolpath files in that job folder. And I also, when I'm actually previewing a, um, a toolpath and I'm previewing a design, whatever it may be, and stuff, I actually also save a preview image in my job folder uh, so that um, and it's a proof image and I usually save it as a JPEG so that way when I go and look at that uh, job file and everything if I go into my documents folder and into my library chair, doo -doo -doo -doo, chair li ladder, sorry, not library chair, chair ladder. I've got my toolpath file. I've got my SketchUp file that I used when I drew it up, you know, it didn't sketch up. I've got my design file and then I have my proof image and everything is nice and organized inside of my job folder. It kind of keeps things organized. So Ronnie, I hope that helps with uh, your question as far as how to save your files. And everything. All right, so let's uh, jump back down to uh, skip here. If I set the toolpath to cut outside the vector and things are tight, this mod can give a little more clearance. That's an allowance. That's an allowance. So uh, now, I, now I'm with you, uh, Skip. And so uh, what Skip is referring to is if I were to look at my toolpath here, and we look at the toolpath, right now we're in wireframe view. And uh, the wireframe view basically shows the path of the bit, the center of the bit, and it shows the arrows showing the direction of the cut. Up at the top of the software, I can toggle from wireframe to solid view. So I can see the areas getting you know, pocketed out and things. And I can see where my bit's gonna be cutting. As a matter of fact, you know, here, as there's gonna be radiuses here instead of these sharp corners because my bit is round and stuff. But what uh, Skip is referring to is our allowance. If I need that toolpath to uh, come over the line just a little bit or, you know, away from the line a little bit, I'm gonna use an allowance, a pocket allowance or a profile allowance, an allowance of a cut. Now, a negative number, if I go negative 0.02, that's gonna bring me over the line. If I use a positive number, that's gonna bring me away from the line, you know, more inside. So let's do a negative number first and let's calculate the toolpath. And if we look at our 2D view, you can see that now my tool, my bit is allowed to cross over that vector by a few thousandths of an inch. You know, that negative number, that 20 thousandths of an inch. If I were to use a positive number when calculating the toolpath, then my toolpath is going to be within 20 thousandths of an inch inside the cut. So it's going to be within 20 thousandths of an inch inside the cut. You know, so negative number goes over the line, you know, go, you know, exceeds the line. Uh, positive is away from the line, inward and everything uh, for the pocket cut. Now for a profile cut, same thing. If I'm going to use an allowance, if I'm, if I'm doing an outside cut and I'm using an allowance, a negative number lets me cross over the line. A positive number brings me away from the line more. 
and generally if I was doing an outside cut and and everything and I was using a positive number let's say point one two five and I calculate that profile cut toolpath and we go look at our solid view and everything you can see that now my router bit is cutting an eighth of an inch away from my line with that positive number okay if I use a negative number negative that's going to take that toolpath to cross over the line by that eighth of an inch inward. So I'm going to basically be kind of, uh, you know, undercutting this part a little bit and stuff. So that is your pocket allowance or your profile allowance or your allowance offset. Uh, different toolpaths, uh, you know, call it different. This is an allowance offset for a profile cut. When you're using a pocket, it's called a pocket offset, uh, pocket allowance. And so negative number brings you over the line, positive number away from the line. Okay, Skip? All right. Hopefully that clarifies that, and I'm glad we were able to clear that up and get uh, you know on the same page with what in the world you're asking, because it, it threw me there for a minute. I got stumped right out of the gate. All right, excellent. Okay, let's see here. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining in tonight. Thanks for joining in. Um, let's see here. Ken Singleton, uh, I know you have covered this before, but... I got stumped today trying to measure a degree of angle, trying to verify if 22 and a half degrees was the angle. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, let's go into our drawing tools. And uh, let me draw a rectangle here. Let me go into node editing and I'm going to move that in just a little bit so it's not exactly 90 degrees, right? So, and you know, let's say I want to measure my angle. That's going to be the dimension tool, Ken. The dimension tool. And we're going to be using an angle dimension. Now, with the angle dimension, what you want to do is you want to, your first click needs to be at the apex of the angle is apex the right word for that term uh you know that uh i want to call it the apex uh but i don't know if that's the right mathematical term somebody correct me if i'm wrong but uh you want that your first click to be there now i'm going to draw a line straight across and i'm going to click again now i've got almost like a protractor here and so I'm going to bring it up to my line here and I'm going to click again. And I have two ways that I can measure. I can measure inside or I can measure outside angle. Either one. So we'll measure inside angle here and uh, you'll click to get that where you want it. And, you know, in this case, it's 76.1 degrees. If I were to do that again and measure an outside angle, then I'd be at 283.9 degrees if I wanted to do an outside angle. So Ken, that's how you would measure an angle uh, using the angle dimension. And your first click is at the, I wanna call it the apex, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, a vertex, thank you, Ron, uh, at the vertex of the angle. And you're gonna you know, come across one, it doesn't matter which way you come across. So I could click here and I could bring it up here and click and then bring this down to this line and get the same results okay so it doesn't matter which direction you go on that angle but it's just one two three and then get your you know where you want it outside or inside four and then your click for your final measurement okay so that's how you would do that now in the measuring tool measure distance area length etc you know, with my measuring tool, it's like a tape measure. You know, um, I can measure a distance between two points. I can measure a span or contour, you know. Um, I can measure, uh, you know, a model cross-section if I'm working with a model. But the measure between two points, measurement between two points, angle is here. So if I'm in the measurement tool, which is the last icon on edit objects, if I'm in the measurement tool, um, I should be able to click from here to here. And it should tell me my distance, but also 
my angle 33.1 degrees now that angle of thir negative 33.1 degrees I believe that is going to be an outside angle so let's see how accurate that is and let's make sure that I'm on my points I'm gonna un I'm gonna close this I'm gonna open it up again and let's let's make sure how accurate we are so I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna stretch down here and that's gonna say negative 29.5 degrees over that 1.14 inch measurement that I measured there well let's go in here and let's grab our dimension tool and let's click here and come down to right about there come over to here and 103 degrees on the inside angle there but let's do that again on an outside angle and see if we're close to that 29.5 so it's not going to tell me uh, you know that low degree but if I did my math you know we could see how far off it is and everything I prefer using the dimension tool versus the measure tool but um, you know the measurement tools angle is only going to be across the distance that you measure you know so uh, the question of the day is 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 it going to give you the information that you need possibly uh, which tool is going to be best for the job is what you'll have to decide Ken and for me it's the uh, it's the um, dimension tool okay hopefully that helped Ken all right let's see here Sherry Fuller, could you review how to create a surface planning toolpath for small projects? Not the wasteboard surface planning, but any surface planning. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and <clears throat> let's close out of this project here. And let's start a new project. And uh, this project, I'm going to go, uh, let's go 12 inches uh, wide by 8.5 inches. 12 inches long by eight and a half inches wide, uh, three quarters of an inch thick. I'm going to be working off of uh, the material surface or machine bed, either one. I'm going to go material surface to make things easier. And I'm going to start from the bottom left corner. So I'm going to click OK. Now, <clears throat> when creating this surfacing toolpath, it kind of depends on the size of the bit that you're going to be using, you know, how far you want to step over your vectors. So for me, my surfacing bit is an inch and a quarter, or an inch and an eighth, sorry. An inch and an eighth in diameter. Okay, one of my surfacing bits is an, bits is an, inch, and, is an inch and one eighth. And so um, I, wa <clears throat> I wanna know that when I'm creating my vector lines. Let me get something to drink. <clears throat> because I was getting a frog in my throat and I was sounding a little rough. And so for this, I'm gonna use a, so, so let's talk about surfacing. So there's a couple of ways we can do it. One, we could use a pocket cut to do a surfacing toolpath. Or two, we could use our profile cut. I'm a big advocate of doing a profile cut for a surfacing toolpath because I want to cut in a conventional direction. I don't want to go back and forth, back and forth, you know, uh, where I'm doing a conventional cut, climb cut, conventional cut, climb cut. I want to go in one direction across my surface with my grain and things uh, and all. So I'm going to use a profile toolpath. But for those of you that want to know how to do it as a pocket, if I was doing it as a pocket, I would create a boundary around my perimeter and I would offset that boundary outward <clears throat> probably by about a quarter of an inch create sharp corners delete the original and click offset and so that way when I'm doing this cut my bit can get to all the edges you know and I personally I like my bit to be able to go off the board so on the ends 
of my projects, they would actually be a little bit wider. I want my bit to be able to clear the surface of the board. But now when it's pocketing, I'm doing a raster and it's kind of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you know? So I'm climb cutting, conventional cutting, climb cutting, conventional cutting. And I'm not a big fan of that. So, but I would create this and then I would come over and create my pocket tool path and I'm only take I'm either doing a zero cut depth and I'm just leveling the surface out to the lowest point of the board, or I'm going maybe 0.01 or 0.02. I'm just taking a few thousandths of an inch off to surface that. Now the method I'd like to teach you is using a profile toolpath. And that begins with a line. So we're gonna draw a line from here to here. And this line, again, I want it to start off my board. So I'm going to hold down my shift key and I'm going to extend this line out in both directions. So my bit is starting off my board and then ending off the board. Now, if I look at node editing here, my start point is right here. Okay, that green node is my start point. And so... <clears throat> I'm now going to offset this line across my material and I'm going to have multiple paths. So for me, I'm using a 1.125 end mill and I want that end mill to step over somewhere between 33.3 to 40% of the bit. In my case, I will do a third of the bit. So I'm just going to divide this by three and that's gonna give me my step over. So about a 3 eighths of an inch step over. So now I want uh, you know, uh, to select the new. Uh, it doesn't matter, there's no sharp corners here so we don't have to create sharp corners. But select new definitely because I wanna be able to click offset. And you notice I'm going the wrong direction so we're gonna undo that. And I need to make sure that I'm going inward. We're going inward from this line, inward of this line, not outward. So I want to go inward and I want to just offset all the way across my material. Okay. Now, my last line here kind of ended off the board and everything. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to center all these up on my material. I'm going to center them up and that way I have a little bit of an overhang on this side and a little bit of overhang on that side. Okay, that way my bit you know, it's going to, you know, give me some nice clean edges. Now, once again, if I were to look at these, because I offset these, if I were to look at node editing on these, all of my start points are in the same direction. I'm going from here to here. Then my bit is going to raise up above my material, come back to the next start point, and then conventionally cut across. It's going to raise up, come back to the next start point, and cut across. Raise up, come back to the next point, and cut across, and everything. So I want to cut in one direction. Okay, I want to conventionally cut. So now that I have these, now what's important with the profile toolpath is uh, first of all, I'll do a 0.01 cut depth, that's fine. And I'm going to choose my bit. That's not the right one. Oh. The right one is my one and three eighths. So let me change some things. I want that bit, but let me change my vectors. I, I had the wrong number on there. Let's get, um, let's delete these lines here and let's go back into that offset. And I knew that sounded a little odd. 1.375 divided by three equals. And I'm gonna offset that line based on my one and three eighths inch bit. I knew one and an eight sounded a little odd, but I wasn't sure. All right, let's get that centered up. Okay, so now I have the proper spacing and that's uh, stepping over 33.3% of my bit. So now I wanna be on the line, okay? And what's important is my start at and my order in the profile cut. Now, if you don't see these options, then you need to check the box that says show advanced toolpath options. If you don't see 
those options in your profile toolpath. Check off the box that says show advanced toolpath options and you'll see all the advanced options here. And we have two options down here, start at and order. Now by default, the software is running the file from left to right, bottom to top in a grid pattern, okay? And in this case, from left to right, bottom to top, that's actually running in the proper order that I wanna run, but a lot of times it's not. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uncheck these boxes and I'm gonna use the vector selection order. And I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna hold down my shift key and I'm gonna select the vectors in the order that I want them to run. And in my case, it is from left to right, bottom to top, so I could have just left those options as the default. But I'm using the vector selection order, so I'm gonna select the vectors in the order that I want them to cut. Okay, now the start at, I want, I do not want to optimize the start points. Optimizing the start points, the it's going to go here, over to here, back, over to here, back, over to here, back, the shortest start points and everything. I want to keep my current start points. So I want to start and carve in one direction. And up here, this direction, I want to conventionally cut. Okay, I want to use the conventional method. So I'm going to calculate that surfacing toolpath. And this is going to be the same no matter what size your board is. And I'm going to calculate that toolpath. And if we take a look at it, let's spin around here. <clears throat> My cut is going to start. Oops, let me see if I can tilt that a little bit more. It's going to start and it's gonna cut, it's gonna raise up above the material, travel back to the next start point, come down, mill across, raise up, come back to the next start point, mill across, mill across, mill across, mill across, until it's done. So that's how you would create a surfacing toolpath if you need to surface a piece of material or if you need to surface your wasteboard or anything. You know, I use this a lot when I'm uh, surfacing uh, cutting boards, you know, uh, ingrain cutting boards and stuff and flattening them out. I use my CNC as a surface planing bit or tool and uh, like a router plane almost. But um, that's how you would do it, Cher. All right, let's get out of that. Let's turn off that tool path and get rid of these vectors. All right, let's see what we've got here. So Kevin, yeah, we could absolutely do a class on cutting vinyl records. Um, how we would, uh, you know, I would typically use two-sided tape for that. Uh, you know, that way the... Uh, I could secure the record down uh, using uh, end mills, uh, O-flute bits, and things like that to cut a design or a small end mill, especially if you're doing some kind of intricate, you know, uh, scenery or something in, in the record or what have you. But yeah, we could absolutely do a class on that. I'd like to save that class for when I'm actually out at the machine, and we could do a class on uh, designing it. Uh, and we could actually be at the machine to clamp it down and, uh, you know, cut it and stuff. So, uh, I'll be moving to, uh, Maryland, uh, Friday, this Friday. So maybe in the next week or two, we could have a class on that, Kevin. Sounds like a plan. So Debbie, uh, should we use the helical G code? Well, Debbie, uh, it, 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 that's a twofold, or that's a question that requires two things, not a twofold question. One, if you're running the Vetric software 9.5 or greater, and two, you're running Planet CNC TNG's latest version, which is the uh, September 17th or 9-17-2018 version, the latest version, then absolutely I highly recommend using the latest post-processor of the Digital Wood Carver Helical Arcs Inch tap. 
absolutely recommend it because uh, it reduces the uh, lines of g-code uh, runtime and stuff and uh, provides smoother cuts around corners and things like that so I would recommend it as long as you are using the working with the latest version of Vetric and you're using uh, the latest version of Planet CNC TNG CNC USB controller will not support or does not support helical arcs okay all right Laney, can you explain what and how the increments what and how the increment and save works can you explain what and how the increment and save works increment uh, Jeff is that a is that a tool where where would I find increment and save I've never heard of it so if you'll tell me where it is and what it is I will If you'll tell me where it is, then I'll tell you how to save it, <laughs> how it works. Because uh, I've never heard of increment and save. So make sure that's not a typo and uh, be a little bit more descriptive on that, uh, and Jeff, and I'll be happy to answer that question. Um, all right, let's see here. Okay, Skip Evans. Skip, uh, in the job setup, what is the purpose in the XY datum of the use offset? That's an excellent question. So generally, uh, this has uh, a lot to do with machines that have a fixed home position. So let's say that on my machine, I start my machine up, it goes through a homing procedure and it comes to a uh, position on the table. Okay. And I can't clip my board. You know, I, I need to know when I, where I clamp my board on my table and I need to know the distance from where my machine's home position is, the machine's XY0, to the XY0 of my board. So let's say, for instance, uh, let's ignore the uh, white um, box for a minute. Let me see how. So let's. Imagine I'm going to draw a table out. All right. So let's say my, my machine, you know, goes through its homing position and everything. And let's say on my machine my home position for my machine is somewhere in this general area and I clamp my board where this white box is on my machine I don't clamp it you know that's why you see most machines with home positions you know fixed home positions you see them they've got grids on their you know carved into their waste board and those grids are you know either one inch apart or inch and a half or whatever so they know where they're clamping and all but the distance the distance from my machines XY0 home to my materials XY0 home, the bottom left corner, that is the offset. And so in my job setup, I'm working on the bottom left corner, but I need to put in the dimensions of where that offset is. And 
and it will move my material from here to over here, you know, where that red dot is, you know, based on like, let's say for instance, if my machine, let's grab this, Let's get my machine set up on, oops, I moved the whole gantry across. Let's say that I was zero here and my board was clamped two inches on X, three inches on Y, and I click OK. Let me put this back on the home position. Get back over there. You know, the offset distance from my machine's home position to my works, you know, bottom datum point is what you would use that offset for, Skip. Okay. All right. That's what it's for, generally. I'm sure there's other uses for it, Skip and all, but that's the main purpose. Uh, let's see here. Would you use the same surface planing process for a wasteboard? Yes, David Kinsey, you would. Or I would, at least. But yes. Uh, how can you tile with a surface cut? How can you tile with a surface cut? Well, uh, you would tile the toolpath, uh, Steve, you would tile the toolpath pretty much just like you tile any toolpath. So if I had this uh, surfacing toolpath here, you know, uh, and let me get rid of this offset real quick. Okay, if I had this surfacing toolpath and this toolpath was on a longer board and everything, I could still tile that toolpath, you know. Um, let's say that, uh, you know, we're gonna use a 12 inch board here. Let's say my tiles, uh, you know, I'm feeding my board through my X axis and let's say I'm, you know, six inches or whatever. Uh, you know, I am gonna, it's going to surface, uh, you know, the first toolpath and let's recalculate this or look at this, uh, you know. It's gonna go that six inches, raise up, come back, go that six inches, raise up, come back, go, 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 go. And then when we move the board down, it's gonna do the next six inches. You know, so you would surface, you would tile it just like a regular tile job. Now in this case, I would not zero out on the surface of the material. I would use my waste board as a reference. So I would zero it out on my waste board. That way I'm zeroing out on a known flat surface each and every time, you know. Um, but in this case, I don't have to reserve. I'm not changing bits. I don't have to re zero out my Z. All I have to do is move my board down and reclamp it and move on along, you know, but you would tile it just like you would a regular job, Steve. Hopefully that answers your question, bud. All right, let's get back to, all right, file, save and increment. Okay, let's hit cancel. Let's go up here. File, increment, and save. <clears throat> so, let's take a look at what increment and save is. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Dum -dum -dum -dum. The increment and save operation allows you to automatically number iterations of files you're working on. If you select this operation when editing a file which ends with an underscore or a hyphen followed by a number, then the number will be increased by one and the file will be saved using that number. For example, if I have my file underscore one it becomes my file underscore two, okay? So the increment and save option will keep incrementing until it finds a file 
that does not currently exist. So if you're updating and updating, it's basically almost like creating versions, you know, version one, version two, version three, you know, updating and changes and stuff. Uh, it's going to continue to increment uh, until it, uh, you know, finds a number that doesn't exist. Uh, that it will never overwrite an existing file. So that's what the increment and save does. I've never used it in the five years that I've uh, run this software. Um, so uh, looking it up in the manual was the best answer I could give you. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Let's close that. You have a 400 page interactive manual at your disposal, guys and girls. Uh, some wonderful stuff in there for sure. All right, let's go back to. So, Skip uh, and uh, the gentleman that asked originally about. Who was it that asked originally about the increment and save? Uh, Jeff. Jeff. Jeff and Skip. Uh, J Skip, thanks for clarifying what Jeff meant because uh, I totally didn't even see that. Uh, and uh, Jeff, I hope that answered your question. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike jumped in there too on that increment and save because it threw me because I've never used it. And uh, what it does is basically if I have, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a certain a, a version of my job and I put an underscore at the end of the file name, it's going to save it as underscore one. Next time I open and save, uh, you know, it'll save it as underscore two, three, four, five, six, you know, and basically different versions. Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, so so Skip Skip says he uses it all the time, especially when making changes. Because I'm sure, Skip, and you can validate with a yes or no, I'm sure that's very helpful that if you're making changes and stuff, if you ever need to go back to version 1, because it actually worked better than version 3, you know, it was coming out a little bit better and, and all, and you wanted to go back, you, you know, you're, you didn't lose all that data because it, it didn't overwrite it, you know. Uh, it didn't it didn't delete it and overwrite it with the latest thing that you saved because you use the increment and save and so you always have that one two three four five six and you can always refer back to those files uh, you know if a, if a certain version you needed if I, I got to go back to the drawing board I need to go back to where I started from I can go back and pull up version one and you know do it again type of thing so yeah uh, exactly so yes you know excellent. That's good. That's good. That's good. And, and hey, uh, I, I've never used it. And uh, now that I know, you know, a little bit more about what it is, uh, it might be something I'll put to use in the future because it's nice to be able to go back instead of, you know, I usually number my files uh, or something, you know, uh, uh, Wasteboard 2 or Wasteboard 3 or something like that. But I've never, I actually didn't even pay any attention that, that the increment and save was there. And I've been, you know, doing this a while, so that's great. That's that's an awesome little tool. So hopefully it, uh, um, yeah. Uh, Jeff, hopefully, did you hear that explanation? Uh, because I found it and I explained what it was, uh, uh, reading the definition. Uh, let me know. Um, if, uh, if you got that, because yeah, I found it. It's under the save section. Uh, file save, then increment and save. And once again, uh, if I save a file, my chair, and I put an underscore or a hyphen, uh, it could be an underscore or it could be a hyphen, either one, um, what that's going to do uh, with the increment and save option is uh, it's going to It would help if you use the increment and save. You see up here it says my chair one right here at the top. And uh, you see my chair one 
and each time I increment and save, you know, if I do some more changes into it and I increment and save, then when it goes through, notice that one is changed to a number two now. If I go look at my file, I've got version one and version two. So if I want to increment and save, it's going to keep climbing. It's going to look at the numbers that do not exist and it's going to continue incrementing those so that, you know, as it saves, you know, version three, um, it's going to increment. So that way I'm not losing any of my data from one or two, you know, it's creating almost a new file with the ver almost the version number, if you will. Uh, and I can always refer back to my first one if I need to go back and, um, you know, uh, be back in my original design, you know, and make changes or whatever, start over again, whatever the case may be. If I screw up a version, I can always go back. So, yep. Yeah, Jeff, we got it. Uh, hopefully you're, you're catching all this, bud, because I see you said click file and it's under save as is. Um, hopefully you're getting that. Uh, I see you popping in, but hopefully you're getting that explanation. All right. All right, Skip's got a good question. How can I prevent the tool entry location from creating a mark that is left after the cut is complete? Using a quarter inch bit to remove a part one inch thick. So most likely what you're referring to, Skip, is if we were to do, let's do a side view here. Let's say we've got a piece one inch thick and let's say that my bit is uh, coming in, you know, and when my bit comes in and it makes its pass, you know, when it steps down to make that next pass, it's creating a witness mark. So you, you generally end up seeing a, uh, a mark on, your, on the edge of your board or something you know, a witness line and stuff. And there's a couple of ways to prevent that, uh, Skip. There is, uh, you can use a ramp, which has the bit come in at a slight angle and then do its cut. And then it just keeps doing that. Or you can use a spiral toolpath. Now, if I'm doing a pocket cut, the only option I have is the zigzag ramp. And you want the ramp wide enough, you know, so that uh, it doesn't, you know, those witness lines are not um, uh, visible and all. But if I'm doing a profile toolpath cutting a part out, then I have the option of a smooth ramp, a zigzag ramp, or a spiral ramp. Now, the spiral ramp is absolutely ideal if you're wanting a nice clean edge. Uh, now there's another option up here. We're going to talk about the last pass here in a second, but let's talk about ramps for a minute. The spiral ramp um, for a profile cut, it will. Let's let's do a profile cut here. Let's go uh, with a circle, and let's cut on the outside of the line, three quarters of an inch deep. Quarter inch end mill. All right, so my zigzag ramp, we'll talk about a zigzag ramp. I'm gonna do a zigzag ramp of one inch, usually twice the diameter of the bit or more. So I'm gonna go one inch for this quarter inch end mill. I'm gonna calculate this toolpath. And if we zoom around to the, the ramp, rather than a straight plunge, Rather than a straight plunge coming down, going around, stopping and pausing, coming down, going around, stopping and pausing, coming down to the next pass and going around, leaving that witness mark every single time we get that nice little half a router bit profile in our edge. Uh, the ramp cut, let me see if I can get this to uh, rotate around a bit. All right, bear with me. Let me get my board back into around oh that 
thunder. Hopefully my power don't go out. That would suck. <clears throat> that ramp cut, let me get back in the middle of the tail there. There we go. Is going to zigzag. So it's going to take half the pass depth over that one inch length and then come back the other half and then it's going to go around and do its cut. Then it's going to ramp slowly back and forth and go around and do its cut. It's going to ramp slowly back and forth, do, go around and do its cut on and on and on and around. And so that'll eliminate the witness mark uh, on the edge of your board uh, pretty much amount. But the spiral toolpath, the spiral toolpath, calculate, what this does is as it goes around, it's slowly dropping a few thousandths of an inch around and around and around. And it's constantly dropping, constantly dropping, constantly dropping, constantly dropping until it gets to the final cutout. And that eliminates, it gives you a nice smooth edge, uh, eliminating any witness marks and everything because it's just a constant few thousandths of an inch drop all the way around. If we were to preview this cut, if I were to, let's get here, and let me slow it down real slow. <clears throat> if I were to preview this cut, let's draw the tool there. If I were to preview this cut, you'll see that it's barely, barely cutting, you know, as it's going around, and it's slowly dropping more and more and more and more, just a few thousandths of an inch all the way around. All the way around, just keep dropping. It's a constant, like a toilet flushing. As it's going around, it's going down, around and down at the same time. And what we want to do is when we're doing that spiral cut, let me stop that. When we're doing that spiral cut, it's the only time, the only time on that spiral cut that we want our feed rate and our plunge rate to match. So I'm gonna have my plunge rate match my feed rate so it's going down at the same speed that it's going around and it doesn't have to like slow down just to drop that little bit and everything and it won't be so jerky and all. So, you know, as I calculate this and everything and as it's going around, it's going down at the same time. Around and down at the same speed and it's going to give me a nice clean cut Okay Now That's our ramps and those are the two ramps your zigzag ramp even the smooth ramp any of the ramps will help Reduce that witness line and stuff, but the spiral ramp for a profile cut is a really nice clean cut But that's not the ramp is not the only way to to uh, do that skip so what we can do is we can do what's called do a separate last pass. Now what the separate last pass does, if I say, okay, I want to back off, um, we'll go uh, 30 second, 03125. What this is going to do when I calculate this tool path and everything is, let me see if I can get into an overhead view. All of my passes, all of my passes that are going to cut, they're going to be a 32nd of an inch away from my actual final profile. Okay. And that bit is going to cut that, that 32nd inch away. And it's going to cut all the way, all the way, all the way. And then on the very last pass, it's going to do a full bit, full profile cut right up taking that 30 second of an inch off and it's going to clean up it's instead of taking passes down and creating a witness line it's the whole bit cutting that entire profile so if you're doing a one inch cut you better make sure your bit has a one inch flute or more you know um, because when it cuts and everything it's going to let me uh let me stop that for a second. I'm going to turn off the spiral just for a minute, just for time's sake. And let's preview that cut. So right now, it's going to cut, and the bit is a 32nd of an inch away from my actual profile. 
until it goes through all of its passes and everything. And then on its final pass, it's gonna move up to the profile line and be all the way down. And it's gonna cut a nice clean cut all the way around, eliminating that witness line. So that's what the separate last pass does. And we'll um, see if we can speed this up some. All right. And so what you can see is, is on my cut here, that little step over down here at that 30 seconds. So it's cutting away from that profile line and then it's gonna step over and do a full profile cut all the way around taking the full bit, nice full bit. So hopefully, uh, Skip, that answers your question. One of those two options, separate last pass or use a ramp. And I'm a big advocate of ramps anyway for saving and extending the life of the bit. Debbie Miller, where do I find the new files uh, for the new wasteboard and clamps? Um, the uh, In the announcement section of the Digital Woodcarver Owners Group, uh, there's a post, and I'll tag you in the post uh, so it brings you right to it. Uh, there's a post for um, the files. Or on Spindle TV, in the class where we talked about the versatile wasteboard, the files are in the description of the video, in the description of the video. But I will tag you in the Facebook group. I will tag you in the Facebook group uh, to uh, that'll point it that'll that'll just call you right to that post, Debbie, where the files are that you can download. And I'll do that in just a little bit. Uh, you'll you'll see your tag uh, on Facebook uh, in just a little while. All right, good. Oh, thanks, Skip. I appreciate that. All right, guys and girls, any other questions? This is, they're, they're, they've been great so far. These are all good, excellent questions. Uh, keep them coming. Keep them coming. Let me, let me scroll back up and see if I missed anything. I'm scrolling back up to see if I missed anything. Yeah, Kevin, just real quick, Kevin Wilkerson, once again, just to touch base on that. A class on cutting vinyl records, that would get me a chance to cut some vinyl records. That would be pretty cool. I'll definitely do that for sure. Uh, I've got classes coming up. Uh, I'm moving to Maryland, so I'll, my classes, I'll be doing some classes out in the shop. But I've got classes coming up on doing 3D digitizing with a digital probe, uh, 3D probing, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, probing, digitizing, reverse engineering. That's coming up. Uh, I can add this one to the list. Uh, there's a couple of others, but uh, when I'm able to be out at the machine, and I'll be in a bigger shop, so it'll be much easier for me to be out at the machine to teach those type of classes. Uh, we'll definitely do it here in the next week or two, for sure. Ken Singleton, just to touch back base with you, did that answer your question on the angles? If you're still in the class, let me know. Yes, Todd, I'll tag you as well. I will tag you as well. Uh, Ken Singleton, if the angle question, if that answered your question, let me know. And guys and girls, if you have any other questions, keep them coming. Type them in there. And let's, uh, let's go through. Because this is the time to answer any questions, any obstacles that you've had, uh, any questions in the software uh, that you'd like to uh, you know, clarify. Now's the time. It'd be great. And again, if you're not uh, a Digital Woodcarver customer and you're not in the Digital Woodcarver Owners Group, uh, in the if you're interested in those uh, files for that wasteboard, that versatile wasteboard, in the video on Spindle TV channel, uh, the class where we did the talked about the versatile wasteboard, the files are in the file section or the uh, the description of that video. So, and Todd Roop and um, Debbie. Uh, your tag is coming in just a moment. We'll let a couple of more classes come in.
All right, so at Debbie Miller comma at Todd Roop. All right, Debbie Miller and Todd Roop, I tagged you in that post. There you go. Okay, what type of wood do you use for waste board and things? Sherry, I use MDF. I don't use wood uh, for waste board. MDF uh, is by far the most uh, versatile uh, material to use for a waste board. Uh, it's flat. It's... Um, uh, easy to carve into and stuff. Uh, it, it shapes well and all. And um, hell, uh, I could mill that stuff down till it's virtually gone uh, and uh, not get a bit of waste out of the material. You know, when it gets cut into and beat up, I could replace my slats on my new waste board. But for those that, that just have a, you know, a piece of sheet of MDF thrown down on their table, uh, you could surface it, surface it until that three quarter inch waste board is down to nothing, you know. Um, and then when it's gone as far as it can go, throw it away and throw another sheet on there. So it's very versatile stuff. MDF. MDF. That's uh, what I would highly recommend for a waste board. Um, Kevin Wilkinson, did you say you're moving north? Yes, I'm moving to Maryland. Friday. Yes, Ron, when I talk about the digital probing, um, we're going to be talking about the warp feature for sure. Uh, we're going to be talking about the warp feature. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, tool changes using the warp feature, uh, changing a tool pass. We're going to talk about 3D digitizing and bringing those point clouds into the Vetric software uh, as an STL file. Uh, we're going to be talking about all that when we do the probe class. John Esther, why are you moving? Love, John, love. I'm moving for love. Uh, my better half, uh, significant other, love of my life is up there. And uh, I'm moving up there to be with her. Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, Jeff, it's a, it's great. Uh, you know, you don't have to come up with a new name every time you resave or make a change and everything. It's great. It's it's phenomenal. And that's a nice, nice feature. You know, I usually do that manually, but now that I know that that's there, you better believe it'll get used now. Uh, I've never used it before, but um, phenomenal. Uh, Sherry says, I placed accessories, can't think what you would call them, in holes. Uh, when I tried to move or lift up, when I tried to move, lift up and move to another location, male part broke off in female part. So uh, in the holes, uh, your pegs on like your cams and stops, your pegs like in your cams and stops, um, what kind of wood are you using? I highly recommend like an oak. A walnut, a very dense material, so it doesn't break that easily. Sherry. And uh, you should be able to uh, take a uh, screw and uh, screw it down into that metal piece that's stuck into the pocket, the hole. Uh, screw it down in there and pull it out. That way that hole is not clogged up with a piece of wood. Um, let's see here. I see two colors of MDF in my Home Depot, a tan and a dark brown. Are there different qualities of MDF? Absolutely. Now, some people uh, prefer to go to places uh, like Grimco or something. 
to get uh, cabinet grade MDF, which is uh, you know the best quality MDF you could get. Uh, from Home Depot and Lowe's, you're not getting cabinet grade MDF. You're getting a very good grade, but not cabinet grade. Cabinet grade is much more expensive than the $30 a sheet. Uh, you're, you're, you're up there, you're probably in the $60 to $70 a sheet uh, for cabinet grade MDF and stuff. But um, uh, personally, the dark brown uh, is a better quality MDF than the light brown. The light brown tends to fray uh, and, and shred like paper and uh, it, it delaminates uh, and everything. The light tan, uh, the dark brown. I buy my MDF from Lowe's. I never buy from Home Depot. Uh, but if Home Depot does have the darker brown MDF versus the light tan, get the darker brown. Uh, it's a much more dense. The glue quality is a little bit better and it won't delaminate as much as the lighter tan. Oh, Sherry, no, you do not use MDF for your cams and stops. Uh, you use hardwood, oak, walnut, a dense material. MDF will tear. You don't know. You don't. You don't use that. Nope. Uh, not for your cams and stops. You want to use. Uh, you want to use an oak. Uh, you can even use pine or something. You know, like a select pine. But I prefer. You know, you're going to be camming and all that stuff, and you're going to be pressure against it and all. You don't want it denting easily, so like an oak, a walnut, or cherry, something, something dense. Don't use MDF for your cams and stops and all that. Um, but you can still, to get that out, like I said, uh, take a screw and screw right down into it and uh, pull it out. Don't screw too far that it actually screws into the bottom of the pocket, but just into that piece that's stuck in there and pull it out. Uh, David, thank you very much. David, thank you very much. Um, and let's see here. Yes, uh, the darker is the better. It's a better glue quality on the darker uh, MDF. Ronnie, tag you as well. <laughs> All right, I'll tag you as well. Um, and that at Ronnie. Luckily, I kept that uh, post open. Ronnie, I'm not seeing you in, uh, let me see if I'm spelling your name correctly. Bear with me a second. Let me see if I'm spelling your name correctly, bud. R-O-N-N-I-E. Uh, are you in the Facebook group under a different name? R-O-N-N-I-E. There you are, Ronnie Probert. Never mind, Ronnie, I got you. All right, I tagged you in that post as well in the Digital Wood Carver Owners Group running. All right, guys, great questions. Any other questions tonight? Let's keep them coming. It is hard on the bits cutting slow. Uh, Rodney, Rodney, you're talking about MDF? It's hard on the bits cutting slow? Yeah, well, MDF and plywood are hard on bits anyway because of the glue. You know, they're... they're, they're um, the uh, especially plywoods and things like that, you know, the glue and all is uh, and, and everything is just not good on a bit, it'll dull a bit quickly. Uh, MDF will dull a bit as well, you know, uh, and everything. Um, but if you're taking light cuts and stuff and everything, like when you're surfacing, like if it's a wasteboard or something like that, um, it's not going to be too bad on the bits, but. It does, uh, and, you, and you don't run a surfacing bit slow. You're running, you know, 75 to 100 inches a minute or more, depending on your machine and everything. Excellent questions, guys. Let me get let me get back to where y'all can see my face. We're not talking software right now, so let's get back to the full screen. So I can see this pretty mug of mine, my beard and everything. I'm growing a beard. You ought to see it when it's uh when when it's nice and cleaned up. I don't have it trimmed yet. I'm letting it grow out a little bit more before I trim it up, you know. I'm getting ready for the winter, guys. I'm gonna look like a grizzly bear, with a with a nice tight beard. But though, no, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go Duck Dynasty on it. <laughs> but uh, all right, so let's see what we got here. 
Can you recalculate all toolpaths automatically instead of having to click each toolpath? Absolutely. Let's go back over to uh, the software. Great question. Um, notice in my software here, I have two toolpaths. I have a surfacing toolpath and I have a profile toolpath. Um, right here in your toolpath operation tools, uh, let's call it the fourth row down, last icon. There's a little calculator there. It says recalculate all the toolpaths. So you click on that. It'll go through and it'll recalculate the toolpaths. Now there's an error here, my surfacing error, because my I no longer have my vector lines in there, right? I deleted them. So there's an error saying, hey, check your toolpaths. So let me go back in and let me recreate those vector lines. All right, so let me okay. So if I had my tool pass in here and and something, and I made a change, let's say I make a change in my circle here. Let's uh, grab this circle and make it a little bit bigger. I could simply just click on the calculator here to recalculate all toolpaths. And whoa, what I got here? Uh, my surfacing toolpath. Oh, I'm an idiot. I did the wrong one. Hold on a second. The surfacing toolpath should be these lines. And the profile toolpath should be the circle. I had them backwards, guys. Hold on a minute. There we go. All right. So one more time on this little demonstration. If I were to make a change, even on this, even on these guys, I could recalculate the tool pass and do that. I don't have to open them up and calculate them individually. Sherry, so hopefully that answers your question. When to use conventional versus climb? Excellent question. Um, as a default, you're going to always use a climb cut. A climb cut is going to provide you a much cleaner cut uh, and finish and everything. Um, but when uh, we need the, like for instance, our surfacing toolpath, that'll be a conventional cut. Uh, when we need to go with um, the rotation of the bit and everything, because the, the way the cutters are formed and stuff. 90% uh, of the time uh, when uh, cut quality is not a, 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 an issue, um, when Um, let me bear with me a second. Let me uh, give you a better wording on this, <clears throat> what I'm about to say. Uh, let me open up my documents. Stand by, folks. All right. 
I'm gonna, uh, so let me see if I can draw this out. Give me a second. I gotta, I'm gonna try to. Uh, control C for copy, control V for paste. Let me move this one out of the way for a minute. Let me take my scissor tool and cut that, and that, and that, and that. That little guy, whatever he is, why is he stuck there? Let me take and draw from the center of my circle. Let me Term, 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 term. All right, let me find the center of my circle again. Right. Oh, I just had to right there. And give me a second. I'm trying to draw this out, ladies and gentlemen. Rotate around that point. I need a number of four copies. All right. Almost there, bud. Okay. Okie dokie. All right. So when the cutter is cutting and it is taking, you know, in, and it's moving in a direction. That's my arrowhead. You're going to have to deal with it. When it's moving in a direction uh, where it's rotating and it's taking the widest cut shearing down to zero, right? It's taking the maximum width of the cut, the chip load of the cut uh, to zero when it's cutting. That is a conventional or a climb cut method, I'm sorry. So when the cutting flute engages the material uh, and it takes the maximum thickness of that chip down to, you know, and then decreases basically to zero coming out, that, that is a uh, climb cut. And when the material, when the bit is traveling in that direction and let me take this and this and let me mirror it uh, horizontally Move it over here when the bit is traveling in direction and the bit is taking from zero to the maximum cut to the maximum of the cut um, and let me reverse this so it all makes sense here. Bear with me a second. This needs to be mirrored. 
This needs to be, let's take this and move on over. Actually, that, hold on a second. That gets mirrored the other way. <clears throat> when the bit is uh, taking and traveling with the rotation of the bit where it's taking a zero cut to the maximum of the chip here at removing, that is a conventional cut, okay? So when the tool advances through the material and it engages at the minimum, zero, accelerating through taking the maximum thickness, you know, this is a climb cut, or a conventional cut. Sorry, I'm getting you guys confused. Okay, uh, that's a conventional cut. Now, the difference between the two, a conventional tooling method, all right, it causes the tool to rub up against the cutting surface. It's working harder against the material. It's work hardening the material when it does that. Uh, it's generating heat. It's increasing tool wear. It's raking chips across the finished surface, and it's also, you know, producing a poor surface finish. Unless you are specifically recommended by the tool manufacturer, okay, for the material being milled, like aluminum, definitely going to be a conventional cut when you were working when we we're milling with aluminum and stuff, taking that minimum thickness to the maximum thickness of the chip. You know, when we're milling with our, our non-ferrous metals, aluminum, copper, brass, bronze, titanium, that is going to be, you know, conventional cutting. In wood, we're always climb cutting. But unless specifically recommended by that tool manufacturer for the material being milled, you're going to always, always, always use a climb milling method on a CNC. Okay? Climb milling produces uh, less cutting pressure, uh, less heat. It leaves a better surface finish and it results in a longer tool life, okay? So climb cut for your wood, unless you're doing a surface cut, then that's gonna be a conventional. And for your non-ferrous metals, aluminum, copper, brass, you're gonna do conventional cutting, okay? Or if the tool manufacturer specifically, specifically recommends it. Sorry, I had to pull that information from a class that I taught on climb versus conventional because I wanted to make sure I got the correct wording right for you. So, Mike, hopefully that answered your question. Let me know. Yeah, Ronnie, I hope all goes well with my move as well. Uh, uh, it's, it's just driving up there. As long as my truck stays on the road, I'm good to go, buddy. Um no, uh, Jeff, I'm not coming to Paul Bunyan. I'm not doing any more shows until um, the Clingspore in October. Clingspore, and that is in Hickory, North Carolina. Uh, I'm doing the uh, October, I'm doing the Denver Vetric Conference, uh, their Vetric User Group Conference. I'm doing that. I'm teaching a 30 minute class uh, at the Vetric Conference in October, and I'm doing the Clingspore Woodworking Show. Uh, in Hickory, North Carolina, but no, I'm not going to do Paul Bunyan. Most likely that'll be Terry and Burl or one of the other guys. Uh, Gossy Banjo says, can I turn up a mic? Is everybody having a hard time hearing me or can you hear me well? Gossy Banjo says, uh, turn up the mic. Uh, let me know if you can hear me. If my mic needs to be turned up, I will pump up the volume. Let me check my volume in my software here. I might have it turned down by accident. Hold on a second, guys. We'll turn that up there. Stand by. Let me turn it up one more place. All right. So hopefully I don't redline too much. And uh, let me know if that helps. Um, Mr. Banjos, let me know if that helps. Gussie Banjos. Five by five, Skip says. Okay. Um, John says, I'm new to tiling. What is the easiest way to set up for a long sign? Excellent question. All right. I'm going to draw this out and demonstrate this the way that I would recommend a long sign being done. So let's, uh, 
let's get rid of that. Let's go to our job setup here. And let's say that we are doing a eight foot board. Let's go 96 inches. Uh, we'll make it a uh, one by nine. So eight and a quarter, 8.25, um, three quarter inch thick. Bottom left corner, we're not gonna use an offset. Let's get rid of these numbers and click OK. Okay. All right. Now, let's draw out our CNC machine. So my particular machine, I'll use mine as reference. Uh, I have a 48 inch uh, wide table by 30 inches of that machine. I've got a 40 inch by 24 cutting area. And gantry and a router. All right, let me get my cutting area into my table. Let me get these two objects grouped together. All right. So imagine this is my CNC and I'm doing a nine foot board or an eight foot board, not a nine foot board, 96 inch long board and everything and all. What I definitely want to have on the table is, um, what I definitely want to have on the table is, um, I want to have a straight edge. Now for me, I use a Swanson ruler. Okay. I use a Swanson ruler. And my Swanson ruler is a two inch wide um, ruler that's 48 inches long. And I usually have that ruler clamped to the first T track of my table. So that means that my board and everything would be referencing against that ruler. Now, on my ruler, the two inch mark on the ruler for me, uh, one and a half or one or you know two inch mark, either one doesn't matter, but I use the two inch mark. Uh, but that's gonna be my reference line, right? Uh, it's my reference line. And so that's where the edge of my board, my first edge is gonna go up to. And that's where I'm gonna zero my bit out um, on my machine. That's my gonna be my X, Y, zero. Okay, now that straight edge is there to keep the Y from moving. We want this board to trap along that X, Y, uh, or that, that X axis only and reference against the ruler for the Y. It's like a fence, like a fence for your table saw, right? So now on my cutting area, I have a 40 inch cutting area, right? So I don't want to max out my, my cutting area and everything. So I usually set my tiles to 36 inches in length. So what I'm gonna do is, you know, every 36 inches, I'm going to make a pencil mark on my board. Whatever it may, you know, however they may fall on everything. And, you know, I got my machine zeroed out, so we'll get the uh, machine over here. And um, let's take my router, move that a little closer to the gantry. Close enough for this demonstration. All right, so I'm gonna be zeroed out there. That's where I'm gonna start from. Now I'm gonna make sure that whatever's hanging off my table that I have a fence. And I use a roller uh, stand on the front and the back of my table. So I have a roller stand supporting the all that weight hanging off and that material hanging off my table on this back end. And as I'm feeding this through, I have a roller stand on the front that catches the weight on the front of the table. But as my machine goes through and, you know, starts carving and everything, you know, whatever my design is and all, when it's finished and it comes back home, I'm simply going to take my, give me a second, my board, I'm going to unclamp it and I'm going to slide it down my table until my next line falls on my number two mark. 
and then I'm going to carve that next 36 inch section. And then when it's done, I'm gonna move, slide the board down, make sure I'm supporting that weight on the front, and then carve the next section. But that would be the, oops, let me get lined up to that line. Uh, that would be how I would tile material. So I use a Swanson ruler. They're nine bucks at Lowe's. They're about an eighth inch thick, uh, two inches wide. They're yellow. I've got a hole drilled on one end, a hole drilled on the other, and I've got bolts that uh, screw it down to my T-track on my table, and that's my fence that my material slides on. Okay? That's the material that uh, slides on and everything. So uh, that would be the best way to do it. And make sure you support that weight coming off. Cause that way you don't have any bows or anything like that in your material at all. You got a nice flat surface to carve on and stuff. All right. All right. Okay. So it looks like everybody can hear me well. Uh, Gussie, it looks like you said great. Hopefully that means great. You can hear me a little bit better now. Um, wonderful. All right, Steve and Mary Quinn, uh, for surfacing a five foot board that is warped, barn wood, would you mount or secure it to something as you are tiling it? Well, yeah, uh, here's the thing. If my board is warped, if there's a crown, well, here, hold on a second. Let me see if I can. All right. Imagine this is my five foot board over its length. If I've got if I've got a if I've got a bow in it, you know, and everything, I'm you know I'm gonna want to try to clamp it down the best I can to flatten it out and all. Uh, but if I have a crown, like now let's look at the end of this, right? Like we're looking at the end of the board. If I've got a crown or a um, oops, let me get out of note editing mode here. If I've got a crown or if I've got a cup uh, or if I've got a twist in my board where one side is higher than the other on the end and everything, then one, I'm, I'm generally not going to use that board. But if I have to use it, I'm going to do my best to try to get that twist and bow out. Now, if I don't, if I don't want to mess up the antiquing or the patining of the barn wood, and everything and I so I don't want to run it through a planer I don't want to run it through a joiner I want to try to use it as is with that aging on it and stuff then what I'm going to do is if there's any waste on the ends and everything I'm going to try to screw this board down to something uh, and I'll call it let's call it a sled a half inch piece of uh, plywood or something you know right uh, you know that's like a sled and everything but most likely what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do my best and the sled is only going to be for referencing against my fence, right? It's the sled is only going to be referencing against my fence because for the carving, I'm going to use the warp function within TNG and I'm actually going to use a digital probe to touch off on the highs and the lows and everything and everything. So when I put my G code in and I run the warp function, it's going to throw all of those offsets into my Z heights of my G code so that my carving comes out perfectly even all the way across that warped, twisted, cupped, crowned board and everything. Uh, because I've touched off all those points and I've told the software where those highs and lows are so it's actually going to follow that twist, crown, cup, or bow. And that's called using a warp function. Now, uh, the Planet CNC TNG controller software has a warp function. The CNC USB controller software has a warp function. I'm almost positive that things like uh, the software is like uh, Mach 3 uh, and, and all, I believe they have warp functions. If not, there's, uh, there's um, 
extensions out there that can be added to those softwares and stuff. But it does require a digital probe for probing and all. Uh, I'm going to end up using that so I can follow that curve, contour, bow, twist, cup, or crown if I can avoid it and everything. Otherwise, if it's not too bad of a crown, cup, bow, or twist and all, then I'm going to try to secure it to a flat piece of material. Now, here's the thing. If I'm using half-inch uh, plywood as my sled, that piece of oak that's got a twist bow or barn wood or whatever you want to call it, that's got a twist bow or cup, and if I try to screw that down, guess what? My plywood's going to twist right back with it. It's not going to hold that wood flat. So I need something rigid. So does that mean that I'm going to build a fence, maybe a piece of aluminum angle iron? Or not angle iron, but angle, uh, you know, channel or something. Uh, and with a, with a three-quarter inch sled on it, you know, something to give it some rigidity so it can't twist or bow with my board. And then screw down to it, uh, you know, to give me a reference. There's a lot of different ways, Steve and Mary, that we could approach that. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can approach that. And um, uh, we just kind of, we have to, depending on the, the material itself and how we need to get it to where we can reference. I mean, hell, even if I took a uh, angle iron, or I keep saying angle iron, and a 90 degree channel of aluminum, and, uh, you know, double side taped it to the edge of my board and everything uh, to create just a straight edge, like a reference for to slide across my fence on my table, my straight edge on my table. I could do that. Um, but if you're trying to secure it down to flatten it out to carve on, you're not going to get a whole lot of good results because your sled or whatever you're using is most likely, it, you know, depending on how strong it is, is most likely going to flex with it. So that's where the warp function within the TNG software and everything comes in. And then and, and having a digital probe uh, to, to do that, to perform that function, is very helpful. And I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's the best answer I've got for it. Um, all right, uh, so uh, Gussie says, drawing from Fusion 360 to VCarve Pro uh, to set the tool paths. How to do, please? Well, Gussie, uh, one, uh, this is a Vetric uh, channel. I don't use Fusion 360 at all. But um, if you're talking about how to export your files out of Fusion 360 to import them into here, uh, within the Vetric software, we can import multiple file formats, DXF, DWG, EPS, AI, PDF, uh, SketchUp, SVG files. So if Fusion 360 has the ability to export, most likely as a DXF it does, uh, as any of those files, then we can import them right in uh, to create the toolpath. So we would, um, we would export that file out of that Fusion 360 uh, as a DXF, DWG, EPS, SVG, and then we would import it into our software here, and then we could come over and create the tool pass on it. Other than that, that's about all I can tell you on it because uh, this is this channel does not teach Fusion 360, uh, nor do I use it um, in everything. So unfortunately. Uh, the best I could do is say is to export your design out of Fusion 360 as a DXF, DWG, EPS, SVG, and then you can import it into the Vetric. Once it's imported, then you can create your tool pass for it uh, as needed. So hopefully that somewhat answers your question. All right. Okay. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? It's nine o'clock. We're rolling along just fine. Hopefully, let me go. Let me scroll back up. Make sure I haven't missed anyone. All right. So far, so good. Looks like I've hit them all. 
And um, Gussie, hopefully that uh, hopefully that answered your question on the Fusion 360. I just want to, uh, as long as you can import, I don't know what you can do in Fusion 360. As long as you can import it out, um, as long as you, hold on. No, no, looking to draw in 360 tool. P carve, thank you. Yeah, Dave, uh, Fusion 360 has its own built-in cam, uh, which supports most post-processors. The only thing is, is uh, like Digital Woodcarver, we don't have a post-processor for Fusion 360, but I'm sure the guys and girls over at Fusion would be more than helpful, um, would be more than helpful uh, in, in setting up a, a post-processor. Uh, I know uh, for different machines and all... Um, Fetrick has an entire list of post processors uh, to work with. I'm sure Fusion has a list like that as well. Uh, and if somebody, you know, if one of our users, Digital Woodcarver uh, users, didn't have, uh, you know, wanted to use Fusion 360 uh, versus Vetric, um, they would just have to um, make a post processor for the uh, cam side of things for sure. Um, so a banjo neck, um, banjo neck would be an STL. That's going to be a 3D model. So that's going to be the modeling tab in the Vetric software. And you're going to import a 3D model. And those model files are going to be STL models, uh, SKPs, RLFs, 3DS, ASG, PRJ, .x, .dxf. Uh, LWO, WRL, or OBJ. Now, I would highly recommend exporting, if you have the ability to, out of Fusion 360, exporting out as an STL, STL, and importing the STL file into Vetric as an STL, that 3D model neck, that banjo neck, that 3D model, for sure. Now, the DXF, what that DXF does for you, uh, exporting out as a DXF, it gives you your vector lines and everything to where you could do a profile cut for profile cutting. Uh, if you're using it to cut the, um, if you're using it to cut the fret slots in your fretboard or, or things like that, then as a model cut, that would be ridiculous. Um, but uh, uh, you'd want to do that as a 2D cut, you know, a profile cut or something. And everything and having those vector lines and all brought in as a DXF would be very helpful but uh, the neck itself and everything if you have a model of it STL would be a great way to go John says if your pattern goes past your workpiece in your drawing when you create the toolpath does it only run on the workpiece or would it carve air well John in a 3D fashion, it only carves what's within the work area. Let me get back to a normal size board here. All right, in the 3D realm, it's only going to carve, you know, what's within the material. So it's not going to carve uh, the horse's head and everything off the material and, and its feet and all that stuff. It's only going to carve what's within the material. In a 2D world, let me delete this. In a 2D world, It's going to follow the path of the vector. If I were to create a profile cut on this and everything, it's going to follow the profile off the edges of the board all the way around. Okay. 
So in the 2D world, if you're doing a profile cut, if your design exceeds your size of your material in your work area, then yes, the bit's gonna come off the work and follow that path, whatever it is. In the 3D world, it's gonna only create a toolpath based on what's within the work area, not, it won't create a toolpath on anything outside of the work area. That 3D rough and 3D finish cut. So John, let me know if that answers your question. David, uh, where can I go to find three uh, free 3D models on the internet? Uh, Turbo Squid is a great place um, that uh, that that I use a lot. Uh, Turbo Squid is a great place to get three mo 3D models um, if you want them for free and everything. Uh, eBay, Etsy, and all that you're paying for models. Uh, design and make you're going to pay for them and stuff, but. Um, you know, I can, you know, look at models and everything and I can come over here to the price and I can change the, uh, you know, narrow down my filter uh, to free. And, uh, you know, apply that, let it regenerate those. Oops. I clicked one too many times. Hold on a moment. And so I can pull these free models as long as they fall in the uh, OBJ, STL, PRJ, .x, and things like that. As long as those files fall in there, and you know most of these do. Most of these either have an STL or an OBJ option and everything uh, but we can pull those models in now these are 3d models um, you know and uh, they're not typically designed for uh, 2d carving uh, and reliefs and everything uh, if you have a spire you have the ability to do what's called embossing you can take a 3d model and turn it into a low relief carving and everything but it requires a spire to do so but uh, as far as uh, looking for models and, and things like that uh, that's where I would go other than that, you're not going to have too many other options on your low relief, uh, you know, models like if you have eCard Pro and stuff like that or desktop, uh, you're going to be better off, uh, you know, going to eBay, buying models inexpensively, you know, $12, $10, this or that, you know, spend a little bit on your models. But Turbo Squid is uh, a site that I use all the time. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Is it possible to carve a surface from a civil CAD file uh, to make a diorama type surface? So yes, um, you're talking a topographical map type of file. Uh, you sure can. So um, one of the best sites uh, for obtaining topographical type maps, uh, you can get those civil type files and everything from, you know, hell, even Google. Uh, you know, satellite images and stuff like that, or nasa.org and things like that. But uh, we can, um, one of the topographical map sites that I highly recommend is topo, topo.io. And topo.io. Uh, you can type in any place in the world and, uh, you know, Rocky, here, let's do this, Mount Rushmore, watch me misspell that, M is it M-O-R-E or M-O-O-R, Mount Rushmore, hold on a second, uh, to correct myself here in a second. M-O-R-E. Oh, you son of a gun. Uh, Mount Rush. And let's uh, scale the height up a little bit on the topographical.
I'm wondering if we could find Mount Rushmore in there where the heads actually are. They're somewhere in there. But um, we can download uh, this. We can save this 3D file. But it, you just type in any location and it'll create the uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, it'll create the uh, topographical map and stuff. And that's I highly recommend that. But yes, you can carve uh, civil files to create topographical maps and stuff. Uh, you're going to have to, there's a process and it does require, um, uh, there's a tutorial video on it on YouTube uh, from Vetric, uh, like actual Vetric LTD. Um, it's a little bit, there's a few steps involved, but uh, it is possible. It is possible. All right, let's see here. John says, uh, yes, I see that now when I view the toolpath. Thanks for explaining. No problem, John. Yep, yep. All right. Uh, David, could you buy vectors from iStock? I'm sure you could. Uh, let me see what iStock is, David. I'm not even familiar with iStock. So let me uh, look and see what iStock is all about. iStock illustrations. I'm assuming it'd be an illustration. All right, so what do we got here? Uh, $12 for this image. Download this image. Um, let me see what type of file formats it is. So it is an EPS. So the largest size vector. It's scalable to any size. It's an EPS. Stock illustration, upload date, catalogs, and everything. So yes, you could. Yep, if you wanted to join... Uh, uh, that and um, you know you sure could and I'm sure there's a lot of great uh, illustrations and stuff in there I'm not familiar with this website at all but uh, it looks like there's a whole uh, bunch of uh, categories you know sports and recreation stock tattoo illustrations and all that stuff so uh, my answer to that question would be Yes, you could. All right, uh, let's see here. Uh, could I use vectors? Could I use those vectors in Aspire? Absolutely, for sure. You can use those vectors in Desktop Pro, Aspire, 100%, without a doubt. Yep, yep. All right. Good. Okay, let's uh, let's get out of this tile view. Maximize this view. Go back in and get rid of the light bulb. All right. Moving right along. Uh, any other questions? Oh man, I'm almost out of juice, guys. That means about time to go. <laughs> um, my cup runneth empty. If you've been with me for a while, you know I used to drink Dr. Pepper. I used to have a bad Dr. Pepper habit. I would drink cases of that a day. And uh, I can no longer drink Dr. Pepper. So we're down to drinking juices. V8 juice. Tropical blend. <laughs> yep it's 9 15 9 15 here as well uh gussie and so we're on the same eastern time zone um 
you make a tutorial uh, show on how to make a flag. Um, David, I already have a tutorial on how to make a flag, a three-dimensional flag and a spire. And uh, you, you ended that question with do you. I think do you was supposed do you make a tutorial uh, show on how to make a flag. Yes, I have a tutorial on how to make a flag. Uh, and that tutorial is in uh, on YouTube. On this channel, forward slash Spindle TV. And in the video section, I'm a 3D flag side in here somewhere. There it is. And in that section, I show how to make, you know, how to add emblems and stuff. Now, your question is, is do you have a tutorial showing how to make the emblem you used on the flag? So, how to make the emblem you used on the flag? Uh, that was simply taking a uh, a bitmap image. Uh, I'll show you here. It's literally real quick. Uh, in a spire. <clears throat> Let my spire open up. All right, in the modeling tab, I'm simply going to import or create a component, a 3D model from an imported bitmap image, a JPEG, PNG, bitmap, GIF, or TIFF. And so uh, I'm gonna take uh, that uh, icon there, import, you know, create a component from a selected or imported bitmap, and I'm going to click on it, and I'm gonna navigate to uh, my file. So that particular file my navy, 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 is right here. So right upon import, that's a big file. Let me size it down. Go to my size tool and size it down. It's 64 inches by 64. I need 24 by 24. And I want to center it on my material. And if I look at it in the 3D view, right upon import, it has created the 3D model. Now, this is a very clean, very high quality bitmap image that I created this, that this model was created from, and therefore it requires very to little cleanup. Uh, the only cleanup that it needs is it needs this outer edge of the picture removed, this square block here. So all I'm gonna do in that case is I'm gonna go in and create a boundary and that's not going to work for me because, uh, you know, it's going to create a, a, just a rectangular boundary because of my image. So I'm actually going to go into my trace tool under my drawing tab. I'm going to go into my trace bitmap tool. And I'm going to convert it to a black and white. And I'm going to pull this out to right, right there. And I'm going to preview that to create that profile trace line right there. That's all I care about is that circular profile trace. And then I'm going to select my component, the model itself. I'm going to select that boundary that was just created. Ungroup uh, to get rid of this rectangular boundary because there was a rectangular one created as well. And I want this to circle one. And in my modeling tab, I'm going to use the tool that is clear the area of the selected component outside of the selected vector. So I'm going to click that button. It's going to remove the outside. 
and that way I just have my model. Now I'm going to go in and give my model a little bit of depth and, and stuff. So I'm going to increase the uh, material thickness. Right now it's a little under half an inch. I'm going to bring it up to about uh, 0.625. Give it a little bit of uh, depth and definition and everything. And it's ready to create the toolpath on. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Change the display image. Let me delete all of that and we're going to start all that over because you're actually looking at my ugly mug instead of the... <laughs> Daggummit. Thanks for catching me, guys. Hold on, let me go back over there. That was terrible. All right, let's get back over here. Let's do that one more time. Once again. All right, that was funny. Sorry about that, guys. Well, you got a nice verbal explanation of what we're about to do. All right, one more time. So uh, in my uh, modeling tab, I'm using Aspire here. In the modeling tab, I'm going to import or create a component from a selected or imported bitmap image. I'm going to open that up, and I'm going to scroll down. And I'm going to grab my bitmap image here, and I'm going to open it up. Now, right upon import, it's a large image, so it's about 64 inches by 64 inches. So I'm going to change the size. I'm going to reduce it down to 24 by 24. I'm going to center it up on my material. And I'm going to look at it in the 3D view. Now, it's a very clean, high-quality image, so there's not a whole lot of work that I need to do to it. You know, when it created the model, it created it nearly perfect. The only thing is, is the outside, all this wood right here, I don't want. That's the outside frame of the square picture. So I'm going to go back into my 2D view here, and I'm going to go over to my drawing tab, and I'm going to open up my trace bitmap tool. My trace bitmap tool. And I'm going to change it to a black and white image, and I'm going to zoom all the way out to where it's a white blank, and then I'm going to slowly come in until I get a nice defined circle like that. And I'm going to preview, and it's going to create the profile that I'm looking for, this round profile. It also created a rectangular one, but we'll get rid of that. So I'm going to click Apply and Close. Now I'm going to click on that uh, vector that was created, that tracing, and I'm going to ungroup it, and I'm going to uh, delete uh, just that outside rectangle. I don't need it because all I need is this profile in here. And now I'm going to select my model, my component. I'm going to hold down my shift key, select my vector, that boundary. I'm going to go back into my modeling tab, and I'm going to use the tool that is clear the area of the selected component outside of the selected vector. That means get rid of everything that's outside of that selected vector. So I'm going to click on that and it's going to remove all, all that model material outside of that vector. So now all I have is just my medallion type model here. And then I'm going to change the scale height of it. I'm going to scale the Z height of it. I'm going to scale it up uh, right now it's a little under half an inch. I'm going to scale it up to about 0.625. Click Apply. Let it build up to give it a little bit more definition in the design and everything. Close that. Click OK. And now I'm ready to create my 3D rough cut or 3D finish cut toolpath. But that's how I would. That's how I created that medallion. Very easily. Not, had nothing to do with me. The image was high quality. Uh, the Vetric Aspire software did the rest. Okay. That's how that medallion was created. Now, uh, Banjo's, uh, uh, Gussie said, um, uh, how about a, a class or a tutorial on making a banjo neck? Now I'm getting ready to make a guitar, uh, a river uh, guitar and everything. And uh, I may do a class on that, but uh, the neck, so I've never made a banjo, you know, much less a banjo neck. And so that uh, could be something in the very near future. That would be something interesting. I don't know how to play an instrument worth a damn, uh, but uh, it would be fun to try to make one. Uh, so, um, 
let me uh, do my homework on making banjo necks and everything and see if I can uh, relay it uh, in my own approach, how I would approach it and everything, uh, you know, as far as design and all that stuff and see if uh, we can make a tutorial out of it. But absolutely, I'm open for anything. I'm open for anything. Steve and Mary Quinn, yes, I'm packing my heavy sweaters, my snow suit and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because in October, I'm going snowboarding in uh, uh, Colorado. So I'll bring all my winter clothes for sure. All right, let's see here. We're not looking at your screen. Okay, that's where everybody was yelling at me about the wrong screen. Uh, good luck remove. Uh, near the Along with a snow shovel. Yeah, John. Yeah, uh, I'm hoping that there's a snow blower in my future or something like that. A snow shovel. Uh, I'm a little too old to be shoveling, man. I tried shoveling the other day, uh, putting in uh, fence posts and stuff. Holy cow. I thought, man, I used to be able to knock this stuff out when I was young. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, a snow shovel, definitely. It's going to be a fun experience because I'm a Florida boy, born and raised here in Ocala, Florida. So I've only seen snow when I've traveled to the woodworking shows in Canada and stuff like that during the winter season and all. Uh, living in it's going to be a whole new experience. So I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to that for sure. All right, let's see here. Um, David Pinson, where did you get the image? Uh, the uh, naval image was, um, where did I get it from? It was, uh, eBay, I believe, eBay. Was it eBay? I think it was eBay somewhere. Um, yeah, I believe it was eBay, bud. Uh, and it's a bitmap image, a high definition bitmap image. Yep, yep. All right, let's see here. Uh, would love a class on making of a guitar. Yes, me too. I'd love a class on the making of a guitar. And that class is coming because I am making a river guitar. Now, a wonderful YouTuber. Uh, Shit, I want to give him credit. I don't know his name, but he's amazing. Uh, he makes uh, all kinds of cool guitars and stuff. He made a river guitar that has inspired me. Uh, and um, uh, it makes me want to make one. So I will be definitely doing a video on my version of it and everything. Uh, and I think it's also going to be not only a, a Vetric, you know, tutorial and carving video, but it's going to be a full tutorial video on building the guitar. You know, the the wood, blank, you know, uh, all of that stuff. It's going to be an actual YouTube video, start to finish, on my take on a river guitar based on the inspiration of, oh, what the heck is his name? Um... We'll call him Bobby. I'll find out his name and stuff. Not Dave Gatton. Dave Gatton makes some very cool. Uh, I want to make one of those license plate guitars and, and and stuff like that. I want to make one of those as well. But no, this is an electric guitar. Um, let me see if I I want to give him, I want to give credit where credit is due. So stand by one second. Let me see if I can uh, look up the guy's channel because. Uh, if you ever get a chance, uh, definitely watch the video and look at the river guitar that he made. Uh, give him some views and everything because uh, it's amazing. Um, let me go. And it has inspired me to give it a try myself. It's the only ever time I've ever seen anything like that, a river guitar. It's, it's absolutely inspirational. Uh, I've seen river tables. I've made river tables and things like that, but a river guitar was phenomenal. And his name, his channel name is 
Burl's Art. B U R L S B U R L S B U R L S Burl's Art A R T. And the video is titled I Build an Epoxy Resin River Guitar and it is stunning. Absolutely stunning. It's a he uses a curly maple uh, and a deep pour epoxy. Very nice job. Burl's Art. Give them some views and give them some love on that guitar because it's absolutely ins ins inspirational. Tim Sway is another good uh, YouTuber. I like I like I like Sway's stuff and everything. But uh, no, this one was Burl's Art. Give him a look, see. He makes some pretty cool uh, pencil guitars, colored pencil guitars, and and different things. But his River guitar just made me go, I want to do that for sure. I almost said it like Bobby Ducarts. I want that. <laughs> <laughs> I love Bobby Duke cards, but um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been fun chatting and all that stuff. Ho hopefully, this was a nice little Q and A for you uh, to give you some uh, to answer some of your common questions, maybe some obstacles that you're running into and stuff. Ho hopefully, this was a nice little tutorial. I try to do Q and As at least once a month, uh, and um, I try to do Q&As once a month and, uh, you know, those are the times where when you have questions and all, definitely jump in on the class and, and ask. And, and how does epoxy cut? It cuts very well. Uh, it, it, it mills well. It mills like a, like almost like a cast acrylic. Um, it mills very nicely and everything. So, yep, yep. For sure. The thing of it is, is just, you know, when it's all said and done, um... Uh, it's uh, the polishing, you know, the sanding and wet sanding and all, and polishing to a nice, beautiful, clear shine and stuff and all. But, uh, yeah, no, hopefully this was a little, you know, good uh, little class, little Q&A class for you and everything. And uh, we try to do this once a month, uh, uh, once a month. But other than that, the other classes are project type classes and things. Uh, like I said, coming up here in the near future, uh, we're going to have a digital probe, uh, 3D digitizing, uh, warp function type, uh, you know, how to use warp feature, how to use, uh, how to, you know, probe a warp ward for uh, even cutting, you know, surface cutting and all. Um, we're going to be uh, definitely in the near future, you're going to see that guitar build uh, come from me. Uh, but hey, you know, making a banjo, uh, a banjo or a banjo guitar neck uh, and things like that. Absolutely. I, I would love to teach a class like that on that. But I'm sure uh, that's no different than making a guitar neck. A little bit different in the profile and the design and stuff. But um, so you'll definitely see something like that. Uh, how to cut the vinyl records. That's going to be a nice little tutorial. But um, uh, things like that in any of these videos, um, you know, uh, you can always in the comment section of the videos, you can always uh, throw in any suggestions of videos that you'd like to see or projects you'd like to see in the future because it helps me come up with ideas and stuff. And because um, uh, sometimes it's hard week after week coming up with a project idea that hasn't been been there, done that, you know, type of thing. And, you know, am I beating a dead horse by by talking about this again? So if there's something out there that you see, uh, you'd like a you know. Throw, throw the word out to me. Uh, you can always uh, uh, email at sales at digitalwoodcarver.com. You can post in the comment section of any of the videos because I read all the comments. Uh, or, you know, um, just reach me on Facebook, Laney Shaughnessy, or, uh, you know, Spindle TV on Facebook. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Safe travels. I'm going to, uh, I'm driving up there. So I'm driving, I'm stopping in South Carolina at our uh, 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 the South Carolina house uh, for a couple of days and then uh, from there to Maryland so yeah yep yep so my uh, special love Sam she's got uh, uh, her family's got a home in South Carolina so we're gonna stop there and and hang out there for a couple of days and then uh, uh, drive up to Maryland for the move. The fun part is going to be getting all my shop equipment and stuff loaded up and a lot of hard days of back breaking work uh, for the next couple of days getting the things loaded up to, to move up there. 
But uh, now, uh, speaking of that, uh, next week's class. It will not be on Monday. Uh, it will most likely be Tuesday. But what I'd like to do is I'm gonna well, let's make it uh, next week's class on Hump Day, Wednesday at 7:15, and I'll tell you that right up because I am gonna be driving up, and uh, I don't know what time Monday uh, or whatever I'm gonna be getting in Maryland and everything um, and stuff because I'm just taking it easy. I'm stopping in South Carolina on the way, and then you know from to Maryland from there. But, uh, so Wednesday, next week's class will be Wednesday at 7.15. And then after that, we'll get back to regular scheduled classes and everything. But next week's class will be Wednesday at 7.15. Okay, so look for me then. All right, everybody. Thanks for sticking around with me. Thanks for hanging out. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, and hey, if you had a question and you just didn't want to ask it during the class, because uh, uh, for whatever reason, and don't ever be embarrassed to ask questions and things like that. There's no such thing as a beginner question, a dumb question, or anything like that. A question is a question, and we all learn from them, from the answers to those questions, so be sure to ask. But if you didn't ask a question in class and you wanted to, uh, you can always post that question down in the comments section, or you could email me your question directly at uh, uh, cells at digitalwoodcarver.com. And... Um, I'd be happy to answer your questions directly if you didn't get a chance to ask a question or something and all that. All right. Thanks, everybody, for the thumbs up. Thanks, Troy, for that. Uh, Debbie, Rodney, everybody, Stephen, Mary Quinn, thanks for the well wishes and the traveling and all that good stuff. Um, and uh, like I said, till next week, I'll see you soon. I want to thank you for joining us tonight on Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. If you're watching Spindle TV on YouTube, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe. You can find out more information about our training and products by visiting us at www.digitalwoodcarver.com.